but it's uh, going to tell you that you may get a message saying recording. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um, so thank you for coming. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I got a little script here. Uh, uh, this was the reason to read my longish pre-class email, Fred, is put my name in the contact list and take me out in six weeks if you want, but your your email will recognize me then in the future. So Fred, Fred wasn't getting my, my emails about the links. Yeah. Uh, that's okay. Don't worry. Do people know where the uh, the, the raise your hand uh, tool is if you need it? It's under yeah. reactions. Right. And it looks like uh, hmm, there it is. Raise hand. Yeah. It's what's nice about it is it's nice and bright, and uh, it, wherever you are in the list of four or five or twenty people, you'll go jump to the top. So, and then when you finish, just take it off if you want. That'd be better. Uh, do people know the timeout thing? I think that's a football thing. Timeout, but I use it as kind of like a slow down, this T thing. So just you know, if I'm if, you, if I'm going too fast, I'm gonna really try not to do that. That's a New Yorker in me, but you know, um, <laughs> yeah, I can't get rid of it. Um, so, uh, yeah. Does anyone think they're going to want to? Well, I'll ask. Uh, I think Jack and Evelyn, who are not here, a, a library demo. Do you know how to use the library Minerva system, uh, Judith? I do. So you could pick. Uh, you know, get great. Yeah. Okay, that that'll be real useful to you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so as I think I said in my thing is my goal here is to leave you unsatisfied to say. I want more. I want to know more. I want to see more. This is sort of like a, a tasting menu in a restaurant or something. So that's really what this is going to be like. So, you know, I'll tell you what I know, what I've learned. Some of it I've learned literally today, stuff I thought I knew. And, you know, I, again, I went back to check on some things. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to share screen a lot. So you'll see us across the top. And if you want to change how that's arranged, you know, up in the corner, there's the view. And you can make us down in a column or across the top, whatever works for you. It depends on the size of your, your screen. Uh, share screen. Let's see if I did this right. Um, I may not have because we've been on and off, but sorry about that. <laughs> Close it up. All right, well. Now, Jude, sure. how big your screen is. Paul and I are both on, you know, laptops and bigger. But and Fred, I guess you're on a big screen, aren't you? Uh, it's like 14 inches or something. Good. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that'll help. Um, and it's a, it's a a real screen and not a phone. <laughs> that's true. Yeah. yeah, I have I have everything's back to normal here. So the first thing you should see is just a, an announcement. I've been asked by senior college to tell you about this. Uh, if you're not in Belfast, it's not going to be useful. I think everybody else knows about this. So, in fact, the other two folks, Evelyn and Jack, are in Bethlehem, not Israel, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, as far as I know. So they won't, they won't be coming to our social gathering. But because we don't have a location all the time, we're telling people that this, this lunchtime hour on Thursdays is you could find people there if you want to just the socialization is important, I know. To a lot of people so and let's get to the first picture yeah okay so great uh imaging imaging cunningham i think I'll, yeah i don't know if she, was, she says it imaging or imogen imaging i think she's named after a character in cymbeline shakespeare's character uh 1883 1976 kind of important not one of the top you know 100 photographers of all time but i would say 101 or something i think and, and now that I've gone through a bunch of her work, I said, wow, we should know more about her, so which is why I'm doing this. Okay, she's born in, uh, sorry, and I'll go through, what I like to do is I'll just go through the pictures quickly while I read to you or tell you things, and then we'll go back again and you can stop me at any point and tell me, what, what's that, what, mm, who's that? Yeah, tell me that kind of stuff. So we'll see them twice, basically, or more if you need it, but, um, right. She was born in 1883, Portland, Oregon. Grew up in Seattle, bought her first camera at the age of 18 in 1901. Somewhat self-taught, basically, but she got a lot of mentoring along the way. Attended the University of Washington in Seattle. She began to study the chemistry behind photography. She was a chemistry student, but she, because she had done photography, she wanted to know more about that. 
And she paid for her, her tuition in part in school by photographing plants for the botany department. And you'll see some of them here. Um, when she graduated in college in 1907, she went to work for Edward S. Curtis in his Seattle studio. And you may know the name Curtis, yeah. uh, but, but there she gained knowledge about both the portrait business and practical photography. But we'll have two slides of his at the end of this little section. She worked on his project of documenting American Indian tribes for the book North American Indian. It was published in 20 volumes, 2-0, 20 volumes, between 1907 and 1930. Kind of important, kind of controversial. Uh, you talk to Native American folks, they're not so happy about it. If you spend a little time looking through them, you can understand why. We have a lot of stereotypes in part because Curtis showed them to us, or his his idea of Native Americans, anyhow. Um, well, there she learned of the technique of platinum printing. Uh, and under supervision, she became fascinated by the process. Uh, sorry if I went a little fast there. Um, she studied more photography, chemistry, photographic chemistry in uh, 1909, 1910 in Germany. Uh, at that time, even up until practically by the time I got to college in the 70s, uh, photography was not part of art departments and colleges. If you wanted to know something about photography, you either took chemistry classes or uh, physics through their optics classes or astronomy, that kind of thing. It was a practical thing. It wasn't called an art. Um, so on our way back to Seattle from Germany, she met with a couple of photographers, Alvin Langdon Colburn, Colburn in London, and Alfred Stieglitz and Gertrude Kaiserber in New York. And last time I did this class, I covered Gertrude Kaiserber. I'll give you a list with links in it of people we covered last time, so you don't feel sort of left out. There's no real, like, you need to know this before you know that. But if I mention someone, you know, you have to know how to spell her name, for instance. K-A-E-S-E-K-A-S-E-B-I-E-R, Kaiserber. Well, anyway, what they were was, and, and were noted pictorialists. Um, and and, and you, you might see it's changing here a bit, but uh, Cunningham's earliest work was pictorialist. It was, it was a movement. That thrived 1885 to 1915, but it lasted as late as 1915. It was general style, which photographers were somehow manipulating what otherwise would be a straightforward photograph as a means of creating an image rather than simply recording it. The thought was back then that photography isn't an art because the camera does all the work. You press a button, you know, you put the stuff in chemicals. It's not an art. So people felt you had to draw on the photograph with charcoal or paint on it with other colors and such. Uh, and, and that was, and, and also including things like, as you may have seen, uh, some of them were very uh, blurry and uh, give you that uh, effect that a painting might have. Um, well, anyway, so that's what she started out with. She married uh, in 1915 to a man named Roy, R-O-I, Partridge. And uh, he was a printer, uh, as in etching and lithography kind of printing. Uh, and they had three children, one of which their son, Rondai, R-O-N-D-A-I. You know, that's that West Coast people. They come up with these names. The father was named R-O-I, so the son is R-O-N-D-A-I. He became a photographer, too. Um, the family moved in 1917 to San Francisco area between 25, 23, 1923 and 25. She did an in-depth study of the magnolia flower. I'll tell you a little more about that, too, in a minute. She studied, she, not she studied, she founded the California Horticultural Society her images were so detailed and clear that many horticulturalists and scientists used her images in their studies because they were that good. Um, she was also known to take nude photographs of herself. And her granddaughter said this about her uh, years later. Her self-portraits really show her as a sense of humor. I'm not going to show you that because there's so many out there, but I'm going to give you the links to find out where you could see all this stuff. Not because I, I don't want to show it to you, but I'm trying to show you a range of things. Her self-portraits really show her self sense of humor. And she was smart about her career. She actively published her work in magazines and newspapers. She had a good eye, but she was a great editor, her, her granddaughter said. She knew how to edit her work. And so what the world sees is an impressive selection of a, a work. There are thousands of her photographs, well, at least a thousand on her website. Her, her family's uh, set up the foundation. Um, uh, one of the things she did was you've seen in here, industrial landscapes in both Los Angeles and Oakland. She, as you can see, she's been moving away from pictorialism to a certain extent. This is sort of pictorialist right here. Uh, and, and you can tell by the sharpness as she goes along. Um, and at that one point she joined, well, at one point she helped found with like-minded photographers, people you know, I think by name, Ansel Adams, 
Edward Weston and others, they found that it's something called the group 64. Group 64 is 64 is F, sorry, F64, F as in an F number on a lens, if you've done photography or know something about it. It's the smallest possible aperture on one of the larger cameras that people like her would have used. So things are very, very sharp front to back. That was sort of what they were about. It was simple and straightforward photography. That's why they use the smallest focal apertures, not always, but often. And the goal was to create the most finely detailed images. This is a quote from her. This does not mean that we all used a small aperture, but we were for reality. That was what we talked about too, not being phony, you know? So a short definition of, uh, of what pictorialism is not is straight photography. She was moving into straight photography from things like Group 64. She was employed at various times by magazines. One of them was Vanity Fair, and she had a commission to photograph um, fo stars, people in the arts, ugly men of the arts, it was, it was called. Uh, so people like Walter Oland, you'll see him here somewhere. You might recognize his face. I didn't. I had to look him up. Spencer Tracy. And um, it's not moving forward, is it? That's too bad. Let's see. Why is it not moving forward? All right. Back to, yeah. Uh, Spencer Tracy, uh, Walter Olan, and someone named James Broughton, another face I could not place, so I had to look him up. And I'm mentioning him here only because uh, he was an American poet and filmmaker. He was part of the San Francisco Renaissance, sort of maybe even before the 50s, 40s into 50s. They were before the beat po poets in the San Francisco area. But I, I mentioned him because he had a good definition of, of who Imogen Cunningham was inspired by, not him necessarily directly, but in his autobiography, he visited, he talks about being visited as a child uh, by an angel. You know, maybe he was chewing on mushrooms as a young boy. I don't know. You know, they did that in, in San Francisco. So anyhow, the angel insisted, I would always be a poet, even if I tried not to be. Despite what I might hear to the contrary, the world was not a miserable prison. It was a playground for nonstop tournament between stupidity and imagination. That line stuck with me. A nonstop tournament between stupidity and imagination. And the angel continued, if I follow the game sharply enough, I could be a useful spokesman for big joy, capital letters. And big joy you might is a good definition, you'll see, of who Imogen Cunningham was. Uh, you know, she was pretty much uh, a positive person in all that she did. Um, she moved into uh, street photography in 1945. She was invited by Ansel Adams to accept a position as a faculty member for the art, art photography problem. It's called an art photography department at the California School of Fine Arts. Uh, and along with uh, people like Dorothea Lange, there's a picture in here of Dorothea Lange. Um, in 64, 1964, because she lived a good long life, remember, Imogene Cunningham met the photographer Judy Dater, who's, I think, somewhat like, 40 years her junior uh, at a workshop and became a mentor to Dater. And we'll see more of Judy Dater's work next week because having seen this, I said, oh, right, I got to include Judy Dater, but not this week. Um, at the end of this slide set is one of Judy Dater's most popular photographs. Uh, Imogene, that happens to be Judy Dater. Uh, uh, most popular photographs, Imogene and Twinka at Yosemite. And you, that's probably if you've seen any of Imogene Cunningham's not, well, actually, it's not works, but if you've seen the picture of Imogene Cunningham, that's the one you've seen, uh, where uh, the elderly Cunningham is encountering a nude model uh, by the name of Twinka Theobald behind a tree in Yosemite National Park. And Data and Cunningham continue to influence each other, even though younger and older people influence each other. Um, I'm going to just end with some quotes directly from Cunningham herself. She was asked, which of my photographs is my favorite? And she answered, the one I'm going to take tomorrow. So she's always looking forward to the future. Um, I photograph anything that could be exposed to light. The reason during the 20s that I photographed plants was that I had three children under the age of four to take care of. So I was cooped up. I had a garden available and I photographed the plants indoors. Later when I was free, I did other things. A um, couple more quotes here. I don't like landscapes. I never had the time to run out when the weather was right. You know, always I would be getting dinner for somebody when it was sunset time, when you could do a nice landscape. I think that's kind of a, a little dig at her her friend Ansel Adams, who had a wife, let's put it that way, um, or, or someone to take care of him. Um, 
uh, or, or the crack of dawn. I'm not there, she said. <laughs> so I'm very seldom have done anything that could be called a landscape, but I do things. Yes, I'm getting to them, Karen. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay. Yes, I'm showing photos and I'm coming back. Sorry, I'm having a, a two, I'm being a, in, by, a two minute here. Uh, uh, sunset time, right? I, 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 yeah, but I do things in a landscape. So, and lastly, the thing that's fascinating about portraiture is nobody is alike. Ansel Adams once said that somebody to somebody, Cunningham was versatile, but what he really meant was I jump around. I'm never satisfied studying staying in one spot very long. I couldn't stay with the mountains. I couldn't stay with the trees. I couldn't stay with the rivers. But I can always stay with people because they really are different. So I'm going to go through them again. I, I didn't quite finish them here. So uh, we'll, we'll start the, 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 the range of them again. I can tell you what, what groups are. That's James Broughton, the, the, the poet, by the way. She did like to experiment in the dark room there. You can see the double uh, exposure. Kind of a little later, 54, New York, 69. She died in 76, right? And this, these two are, are what Edward Curtis, and you may have seen some of his photos before. So that's why we're going to just, you know, they, they're kind of classic. They're sometimes on posters and such. And this is the Judy Dater photo of Cunningham in 1974. She would have been about 88 because she died two years later. The model was Twinka. They both used... Twinka as a uh, a model in various uh, works of theirs, and she actually happened to be a daughter of the painter Wayne Theobald, which is why her name is uh, Twinka Theobald, and uh, but well known in the artistic world. Uh, so, um, should I go back to the beginning? Yes, I could just simply go backwards. Edward Curtis, tell me if you want to stop, and again ask questions, or ask me to pull up a certain one. It seemed like she went from washy to clear. Yes, that's right. Yeah, that was the pictorialism she started with. And then the the movements changed too. The, the, the arts world changed into like group 64 was probably the most quintent, quintessential version of we, we value sharpness and clarity so much. We're going to give that name to our f-stop. <laughs> you know, and she says herself, we didn't necessarily use that f-stop necessarily, but that was the concept, the idea. We thought it was important. I found this one interesting because basically when I look at it a little bit, I believe this woman is homeless. There's a collection of stuff. Maybe not. Maybe she's a laundress and she's carrying stuff back and forth and taking a nap. Uh, Marina District is maybe near the ferry boats in, in, in San Francisco. I'm trying to remember. Mm -hmm. um, I remember that I myself, the only platinum photograph I ever did, because it's very difficult. Uh, nowadays, people sell platinum paper instead of photographic paper is made with silver, but a really quality version, which would last forever, theoretically, was made with platinum, very expensive metals, you can imagine. But you had to mix up the chemical yourself and coat, coat it on the paper with a brush in the dark. It was a big deal. But I happened to have, the photograph that I used to make from it, the negative, was very similar to this. It was an unmade bed. So I think I was being influenced by Cunningham, and I didn't even think about it at the time. You know, um, This, again, is that, that poet who had this angel who visited him. <laughs> you could tell he was somewhat of a, of a, a, um, a uh, well, what, what, he was a pixie. Let's put it that way, actually. He may have called himself a pixie, in fact. Uh, here again, you know, working in dark rooms and playing around, uh, you know, taking two different negatives and photograph, uh, printing them on the same sheet of paper, as it were. So you could sort of get a feeling of the motion of the, of the instruments. You may know this person, Frida Kahlo. She was a painter, but this is a fairly early one, a Mexican, uh, when she was very young, actually. She young. was about 20-ish. Really young. Young, yeah. I don't remember what year she was born, but she was this young. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, I see your hand. I finally, sorry. I didn't see oh, no, I was just going to say these photos are just really wonderful. Oh. And they, they come across really well, too. I can lower this. <clears throat> um they're it's i'm so they must have used a tripod a lot for, for yeah these. a lot of i think not everything as you see at that picture where she's with the tree in the nude she's you know 88 she's carrying a, a, a small camera around her neck but uh she used a large view camera four by five inches or maybe uh, even eight by ten at times on a tripod you could only pretty much use that on a tripod 
Uh, because at the time, also like magazines required quality. They demanded quality because the printing process would make things a little worse along the way anyhow. So you had to have it sharp. You know, you had to have Spencer Tracy. Was he an right. ugly man? I don't know, you know, but he was considered, you know, without his makeup, he was just average Joe, you might say. Um, uh, Walter Oland. I think Walter Oland often played like um, he was used as a the Chinese villain ah. in early earlier movies, if I think right. right. You right. know, he had a little that that shape of his eyes and such. Charlie Chan or something. John, yeah, thank you. That's one of the mm. people I'm thinking of. Yeah. Maybe not a bad guy, maybe he was a good guy. But really? it was or he was uh, he was uh distinct anyhow, let's put it that way. Cary Grant. Was he ugly? I wouldn't think so. That's a that's a really beautiful photograph. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In my it's book. That's a mix yeah, mixed lighting, right? So there's yeah, la the layers or waves yeah. of light. Yeah. Must be underneath a, a something a pergola. What pergola? Mm. Can I say that right? Or a trellis, anyhow, with with leaves above it. You know. So 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 this is Ansel Adams, by the way, her friend. Mm. But there's one of his cameras, an eight by ten inch camera, eight oh. by ten inches. You know, that thing is like a small suitcase. You know, yeah. you could only use it. And I think this one I showed. There are other ones where he's closer in with a portrait of him. He's got a also a kind of a pixieish face. He was a short little rotund fellow, but you could tell that he was jolly, so, so to speak. Use the word jolly. But this that that background is one of his famous half moon, half dome in Yosemite Park, Park uh, National Park. But here he's busy setting up. So Imogene is like the one, not the one, as she said, to get up at sunrise or sunset or whatever, mm -hmm. climb the mountains like some people do. Talking about maybe Ansel Adams, but uh, she made, she went out once or twice at least with him. Obviously here, this is Judy Dater when she was younger, seventy two, and we'll see more of her work uh, next next week. Um, this guy you may know, he's French, Brassai, B R A S S A I. He did a lot of nighttime stuff in Paris, 30s, 40s, maybe into the 50s. But I like this one in special because of the way his eyes are sort of now that could be a thyroid condition too, but his eyes are sort of like pop eyed, you know, not, not the pop eyed, the sailor man, but enlarged. He's kind of like keeping his eyes wide open to, to see you. It, it gives you a, a sort of impression of. You know, he's looking at you. <laughs> you yeah. know, I got your number, Imogene Cunningham. Uh, Lizette Modell was a photographer herself, and we'll see here more about Modell later today, in fact, but also uh, next week because uh, she was an influence on... She Cunningham was an influence on Modell. She was French, younger than her. But Modell then was an influence on Judy Dater, too. Uh, and this was in New York in the late 40s, 46, yeah. I, 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 swear, I take that back. I don't know if it was New York. It could have been visiting out in San Francisco or some, some other city. But yeah, you know, not only say it, it could be Baltimore or it could be anywhere, you know. Um, now here she's going back a little bit with uh, this pictorialism, but she only met Dater in 64. So it's just a little out of focus, but I guess she liked it well enough. Uh, Ansel, sorry, not Ansel Adams, Edward Weston. And again, you might remember him from things like his... Um, the, the, the sand patterns in Point Lobos, California, uh, sand dunes, um, patterns of uh, seaweed, uh, nudes uh, in, on the sand dunes. And the other one that's kind of as famous is the green pepper, all in black and white, all in large format, but really sinuous and sensuous uh, to, to shorten out who he was. Um, this was, I think, his first wife in the early 20s. Hmm. Uh, and there's his second wife. She was also a model of his, too. Uh, you might say a muse. Uh, early, again, by, just by checking the 45, nice and sharp, 22, pictorialist, kind of like a little bit. And back then, you know, that small little mustache was in. <laughs> by mm -hmm. 1939, men were not wearing that mustache unless they were German. Let's put it that way. Uh, you may know the name Dorothea Lang. I think Paul Taylor was not her husband, was someone she was writing a book with for the WPA, um, going around, uh, no, sorry, Farm Security Administration, going around photographing people who were affected by the Dust Bowl in the 30s. There it is, 1939. You know, what's interesting, um, those two people, the Dorothy Line one and the Judy Bate, Dater, D A T E R, Dater, have cameras around their neck. Right, yeah. Well, because well, this was a group where she was, there's Lizette Modell too. 
but yeah. she was photographed. She was charged with photographing uh, artists, among others. But right. also, this is people she can hang out with. You know, right. you, you sort of take pictures of what you know. Where some of this, the early pictures that right. are you know, young children; those are her children, in fact. You know, right. uh, yeah. You know, you can almost not. You can, you can almost kind of say, "Could you take the phone, the, the camera off your neck, please? I want one without the camera." You know, right. but if right. that's who they are, that's you know part of who they are. You know. And and so it has a sort of historical value too for us later on, you know. Um, Martha Graham, of course, was the, the dancer, 1931. And Frida Kahlo, we know, was the painter. Um, tell me to slow down or stop. I'm just going to go back to the yeah, other one. Um, Please. I'll, um, my question was, how did these people had contact to Cary Grant and yes, Frida, right. you it, know, they were they were what were they rich or they were just well, well no known. if if you get an assignment from Vanity Fair say you know you're a photographer Vanity Fair says you, you next week you're going to see Clark the week after you're going to see Walter Olin the uh, Friday you're going to see Spencer Tracy the Jeez. agents all set it up you know the editors at the wow. magazine call up the editors and you know what the actors it's good for their reputation to show up in magazines maybe even a little different you know. Spencer Tracy on a day off without makeup kind of thing. He's not on a set. He's just in the backyard or something, that kind of thing. That 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 sells magazines and it sells the brand, quote unquote, brand of Spencer Tracy or the brand. Of so Spencer they Davis. they worked for Vanity Fair, for example. Yeah, Cunningham did. In this case, okay. she was commissioned for that particular group. Yeah. Uh, sometimes, you know, she worked on her own because, uh, you know, but then, you know, once you've got the photo, you can resell it again. Someone else says, you know, I really like that picture of you or such and such. Huh. We're doing a show on painters. Could we borrow that? Could we rent it? Could we, you know, and you get sales that way? Because remember that Cunningham did sell her work. She was certainly, you know, uh, a businesswoman too. 69. I'm not sure where the Alcoa building was, but it had an aluminum sculpture, obviously. Mm. Mid, go back uh, mid Manhattan, definitely. And if it was Alcoa, they were showing off the aluminum. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure if it was. It could have been San Francisco, Karen. I, I, I you'd have to look that up. Oh, Maybe yeah. more than one. Once you think about it, you know, why wouldn't there be an Alcoa building in Chicago, for instance? Or you know, you know, if you get big enough to be a corporation, you you have uh, what's going on. And these, of course, again, remember, these are sort of our, our remembrance of American Native Americans. Again, he mixed up the tribes a bit. He put them together, and people weren't always happy with it. So. Uh, here, uh, the particular tribe here was a uh, Southwest Indians, Shaiwa Tewa. I am not saying if I'm sure that right, but uh, and that famous one, as you as I say, you know, and here, just so you know, in case you're not aware, so the camera that uh, Cunningham has around her neck, it's called the twin lens reflex, and the way you use it is you look down into it, you hold it at chest level, you look down into it, you're viewing through the upper lens. There's a mirror, but the photo is taken by the lower lens. Some people like that because you're not staring into the face of the um, uh, subject. They feel can, can feel somewhat more comfortable. And also you get a little lower viewpoint, which for some people that's good. And also a lot of times you can sort of tell because um, the squareness of it. If the photograph is square and it seems to work, that doesn't mean you can't crop a, a rectangular photo into a square. People do it all the time. But if you're working with a camera that has a certain shape already, four by five inches, or, or, or you know ratio or 35 millimeter which would be uh judy date no that's that's four by five also sorry but uh the lizette model had a 35 millimeter camera but these are square pictures they're probably taken with that on the street kind of thing pretty good quality you know it's a two and a quarter by two and a quarter inch negative fairly large compared to small what they call miniature film 35 millimeter called miniature film but um fred please yeah so I'm thinking about the cameras. I don't know about to them too much. So these sort of square, um, you know, Format, film, yeah. film to, yeah. and there's a circular lens. So right. does does the light get um, transmitted pretty much uh, the same all throughout the entire piece of four by five or eight right. by ten or um, whatever? Yeah. No lenses do project a a round image. That's right. Yeah, uh, eye is a round image, but uh, <clears throat> cameras are built because I guess it's a human thing. You know, think of paintings or mosaics, or we put things in boxes, right? We put them in 
you know, that doesn't mean they always have to be. Sometimes we make a triangle frame, right, right for, for for an art piece or something. Sometimes they're round, uh, but 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 they're but also what it what it means is that maybe the circle uh, would have been yeah. only slightly much larger than the uh, right. than this this is. Um, and often, if you zoom in close enough to a the corner of a, of a photo, you'll see it's a little less sharp in the corners because the, the lens is a little less sharp. Um, Wow, that's well, like, that's so cool. Because I mean, I know that you have to use silver nitrate or whatever to to process these films, right? So you're yeah, using I mean, that, chemistry that's... on top of this light. That's really these are really yeah, yeah. beautiful. Yeah, and there's chemistry in the camera. Oh yeah, and that's that's silver on plastic, uh -huh. and that's developed separately in a dark dark tank. And then there is a uh, the print that was made. Nowadays, of course, we're using um, sensors that are built into a camera, you know, and uh, digital and such. It's just, it's, but the general theory is right. Maybe thirty percent of it is is changed a bit along the way. But betcha, this goes back to the original start of photography, eighteen thirty nine. People are still doing photographs the same way: a camera on a tripod, something that's sensitive to light with chemicals coated on a sheet of whatever metal, glass, plastic, and then that 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 piece of substance that substrate you might call it is either put into a frame the earlier ones daguerreotypes was a, a sheet of reflective metal and you can yeah, always see it yeah. if you tilt it a certain way uh mm -hmm. where later on we had you know film and glass so with light going through we could print on paper um so anyone got any questions i was going to go to the next photographer if you're if you're I'm ready okay i'm ready yeah okay good i don't want to belabor it uh, but i'll give you links tonight uh, on a like a quote unquote a handout and um uh, you'll uh, hopefully see a lot more of her because especially if you go to her website, the Imogene Cunningham Trust, um, you'll see uh, a lot of uh, categories and then within categories, subcategories sometimes, you know, uh, and, and you'll, so let me get back to uh, our work uh, today. Uh, okay. Sorry about this. I'm pulling this up and there it is. Oh, right there in front of me, photo class. Hmm. Um, uh -huh. I hate when other people do this. <laughs> and here I am doing it. <laughs> Let me just close it up. That's what happens when you have a lot of things going on at once, right? Too much. Well, I just took a Python class, how yes, to program in Python. It was really great. Doug is at his uh, ultimate top thinking level when he's in those things. He's, he's really a happy camper. Oh, yeah. man, he's in glory. Judith Douglas uh, is our one of our IT people for us. And so, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> when you can make the IT person happy, that's important. <laughs> oh, right, right. It uh, was it was really fun. Well, and, Mike Mike Meisner had brought books in in advance, uh, and they were yeah. in the corner of the of the. He uh, was gonna he was gonna let us take them home. And oh, is I, that what that was? Because he I didn't do it pile. this time. Yeah. yeah. I was, I was overwhelmed more or less just to begin with, and I wasn't. But it, it, it's so cool. I'm gonna now. I have to play with the computer. What he showed us. It's really a lot of fun. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you. It's like you know you you make Hello World come out. <laughs> right. Hello World. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's the standard thing when you're learning a computer programming language. Oh. Is can you make uh, uh yeah. I remember doing that on on those big sheets of printer paper with lots right. of little asterisks and dashes and you, exactly yeah. right. Okay, so uh, so I'm going. I'm just trying to mix it up too a little bit here. Um, Nusha Tavakolian. Tavakolian. I'm trying to say that right. She's Iranian, and uh, that's actually her in the lower corner. That's supposed to be the last photograph in this sequence, but okay. I'll just go through them and we'll get there. Born in 1981 in Tehran, Iranian photojournalist and documentary photographer. She's worked for Time Magazine, the New York Times, Le Figaro in France, 
National Geographic. Her focus is mostly on women's issues, and she's been a member of the Rawi Ya Women's Photography Collective. She helped co-establish it in 2011. It's a group of uh, documentary photographers, Middle East, West Asia, North Africa, that range in there. But she's also a full member of the Magnum uh, Photo Agency, pretty famous international agency. Um, at age 16, sorry, I should be moving the photos forward. Uh, she took a six month photography course, after which she began working as a professional photographer in the Iranian press. Uh, so basically self-taught and self-employed, very, you might say ambitious, right? She covered the July 1999 student uprising using her student camera. And her photographs were published in several publications. However, she was forced to go into hiatus and not quite clear some of the reading I'm doing, uh, forced, well, okay. Sometimes you're told, basically, someone visits you, the, the religious police visit you. Um, her, from her photojournalist work, following the chaos of the election in 2009, quote unquote, the wrong candidate won, somewhat more moderate candidate, wasn't the, the party line, as it were. Uh, during that time, she began other projects uh, focusing on art using photography and, and also social documentary. Um, common themes, so stories of women, friends and neighbors in Iran, certainly. The evolving role of women in overcoming gender-based restrictions. That's a big issue, obviously, in Iran, if you know anything about Iran. Um, and also, as an Iranian, contrasting the stereotypes that Western media has about Iran. You know, they're a little sensitive, and that's okay, because we think we know what we know because we saw a photo in Time magazine or something. Well, she's here to tell us, no, we're not all like that. We're different, you know. Um, um, she stated here, we're stuck on, on getting the West to understand Iran. Our work remains on the surface. I want to tell Iranians stories to Iranians themselves. And this is where I could challenge myself to go deeper into more complicated layers. We'll take a break shortly, but um, her work aims to be devoid of Western influence. She's trying to not, so it's not intended for Western audiences as it were. We're considered Western audiences, Europe, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, her work continues to be a real personal representation of, of Iran. My personal reading, because uh, I had not known this photographer before this, was um, she probably found that it was safer for her and her family not to be seen as a threat because reporting about Iran, unless you're doing the party line, as it were, but but making art, artists can be accessible, uh, uh, acceptable. Making art and specifically non-Western Influences are more acceptable. I'm I'm making a judgment about her here, but I think that you know if she was in a safe place, she would say this herself in those words. Um, and so much so that by 2019, Iranian authorities barred her from working in the country, even though she continues to live there. So she had to go off to places like France. Paris would be an often place where many Iranians would go to to get influence in the world. You know, uh, Magnum photo agencies based in in, in Paris, for instance, or Romania. Um, so here's another quote. Naturally, in Iran, it's more complicated to tell certain stories. If you find the right way of telling them, it is possible. In 2009, following the protest, it became harder to work as a news photographer. And I spent six months in my whole house depressed. After that, I started to try new ways, new photographs and sounds, using photographs and sound, but still very close to the real, not abstract subjects. I've been doing portraits for a long time, but now I try to connect the portraits so that a whole, as a whole, I create a story. Again, a combination, just also installation and videos. Younger folks these days, you must know, it, they don't limit themselves. I'm a photographer. You know, I do films, I do videos, I do installations, I do recordings. So um, uh, there's a series in here, uh, we'll get back to it, uh, called Look, and it centers on her view from her bedroom window. You can sort of tell because there's five or six people in the same, you know, general kind of depressing looking uh, apartment house, um, uh, expressing the feelings of those living in metropolises and in Iran, but uncertainty, fear, suspicion, loneliness, and so on. I certainly get that from her work. Uh, she, in an interview, she was, was asked, someone said, it sort of reminds me of dissident art during Soviet times, fighting a regime with emotions and not politics. Uh, and what she replied was, that's good comparison in all atmospheres where there's political current is overbearing, others will try to voice their ideas through culture. Personally, I don't like politics, she said, but it's so much part of our daily lives that I cannot say it is not political. Um, I get, again, I my take on this is depressive, 
But to me, I've known some Iranians when I lived in New York. Uh, and, and what's especially heartbreaking is because the Iranians that I knew were a very lively, creative bunch. But then I thought about it. And I said, well, of course, they're the ones who were able to immigrate out of Iran, or maybe their parents did. They weren't under a big thumb of a, of a regime. Uh, we'll go back over the photos, but why don't we say take that three minute break right now? Anyone want a break or I could skip it? I wouldn't or, mind just going over okay, yeah. and Good. starting over again. Okay, anyone else need a break? I can't hear you, Fred. All right. Um, I th I got worn out after taking that Python class, so I'm going to watch oh. the, okay. the the recording on for the rest okay, of it. Fine, okay, fine, great. No, no problem. I understand. And, uh, yeah. See Karen, you next you time. Karen, do you need a break? Bye bye. See you, Fred. Take care. I, I would like to just see this from the beginning. If, if yes, I... yes. I'm asking Karen. Do you want a break? No, she doesn't no. want a break. Good. Okay, so we're going to go forward. Thanks, Judith. Yeah. So here, uh, Hajj. Hajj is the pilgrimage that all quote unquote good Muslims are required to do, if at all possible, meaning that, you know, you're able to leave your own home country, you have money to avoid uh, ability to go do that, that kind of thing. But and it's a big deal. It's in Medina. And down there, that black box is people spend time, ro not rotating, uh, transversing it. It's mostly men, but not only, obviously, uh, women are, are considered equals, but within the society, they have to be kept separately. They, 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 you know, unless it's your husband or your son, you're not supposed to be in the comp in the company of other men, sort of. So, but as you can see here, she's Iranian. She's not Saudi Arabian. Let's put it that way. So she has a little more, um, what's the word? Um, a little more courage in where how she she walked around in a picture of herself in some window, obviously. But uh, the, the whole city takes on this. They have to bring in portable housing. Uh, I've read about it. It's like it's an amazing feat of one of those things where millions of people show up for a five or six day thing that goes on, you know, um, in the middle of the desert, of course. Um, I think they're 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 almost trying to figure out how to how to um, make appointments for it or something, because now it's. Getting yeah, I, it it's wouldn't surprise me. In fact, there have been people who are dying. Died. You know, because of, of of crowd crushes, crushes people are you know they 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 they're trying to they they say so and so is going to be at such and such. Oh, we all need to go see that person, and you get five thousand people going over a bridge. Somebody gets trampled. That's you know they die is what happens. It, it happens. Well, you know, and also yeah. people are older get heart attacks. Karen. Yeah, but if you've ever seen that that box, I can't yeah. remember what is inside. Right. Yeah, but. The mobs that are just circling that yeah, is yeah, yeah. pretty. Uh, well, I think we'll get to a bit, a bit. Or maybe I missed them already. Uh, let's see. There it is down the corner. And as you can see, there's levels. And I guess at best, I guess it has to do with, can you afford a ticket? You know, if you have a ticket, you can get closer. I think the, the goal is to actually touch it. Uh, and I, and I, I'm blanking on the name of it. Uh, but uh, it, it's containing the writings of, of Muhammad, among other things, I believe. That's what's what's going on. But as you can see, people have to be moved in and out of this city to, to make this happen. Um, uh, this was done uh, in Iran, probably maybe not Iran. She was a little, uh, if you read about it, uh, these are folks who are uh, Kurdish and other tribes in the north of Iran on the border with Turkey. Kurdistan covers Syria covers parts of Turkey, covers parts of Iran. It's does it, not a country itself, but the peoples who are Kurdish. But uh, they have, uh, um, a, what do you call ongoing going? In this case, they were fighting ISIS. And this was a women's uh, um, battalion, you might say, of, uh, oh, so we're going to get power back. That's good. Thank you. <laughs> CMP is telling us we have power. Thank you. Uh, it's the, the, I think, does it tell us there? Uh, the PKK, People's something of Kurdistan, um, and it's, it's a women's battalion. And probably because she's a woman, she was more accepted, besides being Iranian and speaking language that's in common. Here she was in uh, Nigeria, uh, if you've heard of Boko Haram. Uh, again, somewhat, I'll say crazy, that's my interpretation. Religious, religious fanatics who will um, kidnap children, kidnap people, they, they, they do it for money, uh, they make wives of the children, the girls. Sometimes the girls are returned. Sometimes it doesn't happen. Uh, and of course, if that happens to you and you're female, 
you're at fault. I mean, you're not at fault, but the rest of your life, you're you're you're, you're stained because of so what someone did to you. Unfortunately, that's just the the culture going on. Here's one who didn't want a photograph even taken. She was, uh, and this is the subject where it's called uh, "Look L O O K." Her series of uh, friends and you know um, acquaintances in her apartment building, and just the lighting, you know, to me is like it's designed to make you feel depressed to me. Uh, but you know, I, I'm guessing that some of these people are, you know, they're they're they're, they're frustrated. They can't do the things they want to do in life. Uh, you know, women when they go in public must wear a scarf, and if not, there's a religious police that will come and tell them they have to, and sometimes beat them if they don't. Um, uh, there was a young woman who was beat and caused uh, one of the protests that we've heard about. Um, so stop me if you've if got any questions, uh, uh, Judith or Karen. Yeah. I have questions, but I think, um, how can I put this? Um, I'm familiar with some of the things you're speaking about. Uh huh. That, that's my comment. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I am not always, uh, you know, I read uh, stuff, but I don't, Certainly sure. Like I know what the Hajj is, but I can't remember Bakaha or something like that. A name with a B Q A or something like that. You know that people wrote uh, progress around in circles. You know that kind okay. of thing. And, and the understanding of why it's important and what they're doing. You know. But right. I remember the one thing was, you know, if you could, you're supposed to be able to touch it. If you could just touch the thing, it's, it's, it's a, you get a higher place in heaven possibly. And here, you know, this is protest. Maybe it was. Uh, um, tear gas or something, you know, but just kind of like coming out of the shadows there. It's like, you know, uh, this is a, a candidate who did not win, I think, for president. <laughs> uh, and that's her, as I say, in the lower corner. She's yeah, about the age great. of 40. Uh, so I, I, I kind of like like to mix it up with different people. I promise you not too many down things, as it were, but it's not going to be all sunrise, uh, sunshine either. So I'm going to go to the next person who actually... He's a friend of mine, I'll admit it right up front. Uh, but this friend um, uh, recently came out with a book. So that's my reason for wanting to show the work. <laughs> Karen knows her too. Uh, and does it show? Yeah, I still screen sharing, right? You can see that? I yeah. guess, what's the name of, of your friend? Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, I, I guess I should get to the beginning of it. Uh, let me see if I come in. Well, uh, her name is Marsha Bricka Halpern. Uh, it'll show up in one of the slides here. Uh, but let me just I'll get to the end. And, it, and, and one of the uh, things that struck me about Marsha yes. is that she, uh, not necessarily in all of the pictures, but uh, in some of the pictures, she used a view camera for the reasons that Paul already said, which is that people don't know you're taking the picture. Right, yeah, yeah. Not view camera, Karen. The twin lens reflex of photographing oh, down. There's okay. actually a picture of her. Yeah, this is taken in New York. Yeah, this was New York, Karen. Uh, sorry, Karen. Uh, Marsha is a New Yorker like me. Uh, let me just pull up my notes here, just because I didn't. I am a New Yorker as well. Oh, okay. Well, there you go. Marsha was born in 1953 in Brooklyn, New York. Still lives there. And to be upfront, I'm disclosing she's a friend of mine. We were a few years apart at Brooklyn College. And so I'm wondering, can I be impartial about her work? And the answer is no, not at all. I think it's all great. So I'm not being impartial here. But last year she had this book published, Kibitz and Nash. You, so you know the title of uh, Kibitz and Nash is uh, it's uh, equivalent of maybe gossip and snacking when we all met at Dubrow's caf cafeteria. There were several Dubrow's in the city, but there was one near her in Brooklyn. Near I Kings know Highway. Dubrow's cafeteria. It's, you it's, do? It's, okay, there we yeah. go. Yeah, okay. So uh, we're talking to the choir here. 1975 in February. She's a budding street photographer. Um, um, she was shooting storefront windows on King's Highway, and her fingers were practically frozen to a camera. So she slipped into the cafeteria to get warm, to defrost. You take a ticket from the man at the door. The ticket is one where you walk around with it, and as you get your plates of food or drinks or whatever, someone punches it, and, and that's how you know how much you, you have to pay at the end. Yeah. Um, Took a ticket from the man at the door and found myself looking out at a tableau of amazing faces between the coffee urns and the steam tables, teeming with choices and the mural walls under high ceilings and modernist space age lighting. So she, she was in heaven, let's put it that way. Um, yeah. 
uh, Halpern, she, before marriage, she was known as Marsha Bricker, uh, discovered that Dubrow's, along with a few other cafeterias and automats in the city, was actually at that point a vanishing social inst institution. 75 is kind of late in the game for this in some ways. Um, but it was also a fertile ground for conversation and photography, for conversation for the folks who went to it and photography for people like her who were willing to, you know, sell service. They offered cheap uh, coffee, ready-made meals. You grab a tray, pick an item, get your ticket punched. Um, and then you look around and see where your friends are sitting. Karen, oh, not Karen, sorry, I'm gonna make that mistake. Marsha said, there's a theory about communities called third places. After your home and your workplace comes the need for some social institution. In New York, the Irish had bars, the Italians had social clubs, but Jews had cafeterias. So hanging around the cafeterias with a camera, and it's not only Dubrow's, there's a couple others mixed in here. And she visited other cities, Philadelphia and other places, just to sort of see what they were like. She became a noted regular, because if you go there often enough, you say, oh, the girl with the camera. Yeah, yeah, because for one, you'll see, generally, she's, her by age, she sticks out uh, among the, well, the average age being about 80. Uh, but what she did she was, she would sit and talk to people, uh, you know, not just take their picture and run, but and also then come back and bring prints, photographs, because she had access to a dark room. And, and people love to get pictures of themselves. Whether you look good or not, a picture of me in Dubrow's, that's great. Um, so, um, so to a certain extent, uh, the cafeteria, the rise and fall of them, is sort of like part of 20th century American history. It, it mirrors the rise of the office workers, uh, women's evolving roles, because there are women out in the public, as it were, finally, you know, you might say, uh, uh, immigration, certainly, uh, the growth of the cities, and the continuing impact of the Depression, people still, you know, are watching the coins, the labor movement, and American eating habits, you might say. So after, uh, after uh, Marsha got a graduate degree, um, her and a whole group of my art friends in 1976 they found themselves in an economic downturn, especially in New York City. A uh, famous headline at the time was, Ford to New York, drop dead. Ford is in Gerald Ford, the president. Uh, luckily, federal legislation had passed in 1973, the CETA Comprehensive Education Training Act, CETA, CETA. Uh, and it applied, what it did was it gave some assistance to arts nationwide. Um, it was inspired, you might say, by the WPA, Work Progress Administration of uh, of the 30s because it employed artists in service to the community. We'll get to them shortly. They'll be obvious. CETA, by the way, was passed under Republicans like Nixon and Jack Kemp. And there were people who cared about solving problems. And I was thinking to myself, imagine that as a political strategy, solving problems. Hmm, let's try that someday. Uh, anyhow, artists like Marsha, got, she got a small weekly paycheck. She was assigned to projects like housing rehabilitation, which we'll see shortly. And um, another friend uh, at the time who was also doing this work, he went on uh, to retire decades later. He became the official photographer for the New York City Buildings Department because of, of this kind of work. Um, and she also documented some of the large uh, indoor public markets. We'll get into them. I think I have mostly cafeteria pictures here, obviously. Um, the public markets were started in the 30s and they were designed to get the push courts all, uh, off of the streets so there was more hygienic to sell food indoors than out out of doors. Um, and, and, and we still have that to a certain extent now in farmers markets, right? That's Marsha at the Brooklyn Historical Society. And I've never seen a photograph of mine in large that big. <laughs> and she's kind of amazed at seeing it. You know, this is part of a show that was there and, and they chose that one for her. And, and it's whatever it is, it's eight feet by 15 feet or whatever, it's large. Um, there's a picture of Marsha in the corner taken by our friend, David Stark. Uh, and as you can see, she's 22, 23, whatever she was when she graduated from college. Uh, there she's got a, her her basic student camera, 35 millimeter Pentax with a flash. She was asked during some, I saw a few uh, Zooms during while this the book book tour, so to speak, was going on. A lot of it was on Zoom. Uh, she, and she said, I tried flash, but the, the quality of the light was so ugly and also it was very disturbing to the other people. People come there to relax. They don't need flashes going on there. Uh, so she didn't always use the flash. Uh, she gave it up quickly. But she did, as Karen said, sometimes use, um, and you can maybe tell by the shape of the, the format, um, the twin lens reflex, the lens at one lens atop the other, where you look down. But a lot of the Karen, I think I, she was facing the people. 
she was looking at them, you know, they knew she was there. She wasn't sneaking it. This obviously is not her book, but if you know the name, Isaac Besheva Singer, very interesting writer, wrote in Yiddish always yeah. and translated into English. Uh, but boy, if I had my photograph on a cover, I would think that's more important than having my work published is having a photograph of mine on the cover of an Isaac Singer uh, uh, collection. Um, the other thing that uh, happened from that, uh, the, I'll get back to Kibbutz and Nash in a minute. So this is the 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 market. I, what I appreciate here is the the price. Fish for $1.75 a pound, 75 cents on special. Um, yeah. I think the potatoes are three pounds of $4. And then this was uh, housing rehabilitation, but part of what she worked on was uh, things like uh, lead paint issues. I, I myself did a little work on about lead paint, but as you, you know, it, it's a poison to kids brains, especially when they're very young. And the older buildings, they may not have been painted in 30, 40, 50 years, and, and they would chip off and kids would breathe that in and play with the chips and such. Um, this was a gut rehab. Uh, I think this was Hell's Kitchen over on the west side, uh, west of Times Square, where gut rehab is you take pretty much everything out. You leave the floor, you leave the brick walls, the windows come out because they're probably rotted and leaked air anyhow and even the, uh, the 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 plaster walls were you know it was a quick easy way to get rid of all the lead paint was take the walls off you know it was a lot of work dirty work but someone had to do it and they were getting good money and she was getting a little money um i think they paid for her film and and and, and chemicals and paper but she got like i say a small check weekly but this though um i just wanted to because in case you don't know, yeah but i didn't know about this marcia turned me on to this i went and photographed there several years this the ultra orthodox days of Hol Hamoed, C H O L H A M O E D, Hol Hamoed. It's the intervening days of Passover holidays. There, it could be any, practically any holidays that goes on for several times, but specifically this is the Passover. So they would be in, the, the first part and this last part would be the most important parts of the holiday. In between, there were usually non school days, non work days, uh, and it was warming up in spring. So families would leave the comfort of, you know, the, the, the insular communities. They might live in places like Crown Heights and Williamsburg. And um, so organizations who rent out smaller child-oriented amusement park like Coney Island. Uh, I think this was Astroland, some of this. Uh, and, uh, and, and they would enjoy the beach. Kids who never get to see much nature. They're living in the city, you know, Brooklyn. But here they are. You can't get much more nature than the Atlantic Ocean, right? You know, uh, you know. Boys are always going to be boys. They're going to take a hole because they do, you know. But this was interesting, I found, and I've seen this happen. I was there uh, when they would do this. He's a member of the Modesty Squad. So underneath here, there'd be a painted mural of uh, a tiger oh, that was okay. also a woman. Oh. And there would be a, a, a yeah. you know, but she'd be nude. And that was not permissible. So they'd send out, this guy, believe it or not, he looks young, but he's probably a father already, the age of 20 or something. And they were masking tape and uh, and, and garbage bags and cover the, the offending pictures of the modesty squad, they called it. Um, I, I, I laugh at this one because it's kind of, uh, yeah. Uh, what was it called? Stremel. Stremel, Stremel was the big hat. It has its origins in Tartar, Turkish, Russian, Polish origins. But the religious used it as a second covering atop whether either yarmulke or kippah. Kippah is the Hebrew word, yarmulke is the, the Yiddish word. Uh, and for special occasions. So you, you know, you put this on because it was expensive, it, from a thousand dollars up to five thousand dollars or something. It was it was fur, it was expensive fur. Um and uh but here she's making a statement about special occasions. You know, the kids get to ride on this thing that they normally would not see in Crown Heights or Williamsburg, and here's dad watching them with his hat and but his I special have a occasion. different take on it. Oh please. See the shape of the hat and the shape of the um ride that they're on are they oh not yes yeah so yeah one another <laughs> yeah that's right it turns out there are different versions of this hat there are some that are more cylindrical but that had to do more with what region you may have come from right uh you know that kind of thing I, i'm i'm not up on all that stuff but i had to look up the pronunciation of this i knew the name but you know pronunciation is, is not you know i looked that up with it and that's one last uh, thing i think that i'll say um uh one of the things with uh, the the uh, uh the book of, uh, what's it called? Oh, it's not in focus, yeah. Kibitz and Nash. Kibitz and Nash, right. 
besides having a picture on the Isaac Singer collection, in the back of this book, there's a mention of that fellow, Paul Sheridan, and he's right there in between Walter Rosenblum and Lizette Modell. So, so there I am being mentioned in the same sentence as some pretty important people in this history of photography. Uh, one what of are which you is being Martin. mentioned for? Uh, just as being one of her teachers and supporters uh, at the back. You know, people always would put, you know, acknowledgments, thank you to my family, thank you yeah. to my editor, you know, That's such nice. and such Cornell University. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's the first time I think that I'm aware of that I ever got mentioned in someone else's um, acknowledgments, as it were. Very nice. Okay, so let me just see. Was there any more? Sure. I think that was the end of Marsha, as it were. But yeah. I'll give you again lots of um, links. Paul, let me just yes. interrupt. For what was it, 30, 35 years? You were yes. the lab technician and instructor at the photography lab at Brooklyn College. So right. that's, that's, uh, that's how I knew her, yeah. You got to know a lot of people, uh, including yeah. Marsha. Yeah, Marsha had a, yeah. Marcia had a particular true. relationship in that because she was a couple of years younger than me, when I would be promoted from one job to the next job, she would take mine. <laughs> they, they would say, Shawasha, you want to do this job? You know that stuff, right? Paul will help you. He'll show you what you need to know, that kind of stuff. And so there's several times where, you know, in the middle of a semester, I was hired full time to be the lab tech. I was a member of the faculty, but I was no longer a graduate assistant teaching a basic, you know, art, art class. So I'm not going to leave the students in that class left alone. So they had the money for it, obviously. Uh, so they signed her to finish the class up. So they got two teachers for the price of one, as it were. But uh, so you um, must have lived in Brooklyn or Queens. Yes. But Brooklyn, my yeah. theory is people that lived in the Bronx, which was me, went to City College or Lehman, which was then Hunter up there. Sure. Yeah. People that were from Brooklyn stayed in, on the other side of the bridge. Mm -hmm. Karen, are you from New York? Yeah, I was born in, in Greenwich Village spent the first three years of my life in Greenwich Village with my family and then moved to Westchester County. Where in Westchester? I grew up. Briarcliff Manor. Okay, so I, I am it's a, a It's a village. Place. What I think is hilarious, it's, it's a village. Yeah. The size of the city of Belfast. So, population 7,000. And course. so when okay. people... You know, when people correct me and say, oh, no, it's a city of Belfast. They say, give me a break. You know, I grew <laughs> up in a village that size. The same size, yeah. yeah. It's interesting, but, yeah. How long have you been here in Maine? 2006, so it's coming up on 18 yeah, we, years, I we've think. we've been here since September of 2006. Okay, neat. I moved here in 2013. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we moved here, what? Uh, a few years after 9 11. Yeah, so in New York. 9 yeah. 11, yeah. as maybe so were you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We could uh, reminisce someday. <laughs> yeah. Not, not, on, uh, not on recording here, but. No. That's right. Thank you. No, yes, remember you're being recorded. Yeah. So I have another one up here. Uh, share screen. This, How many are you planning to cover? Because there's a certain amount of glazing over that takes place. I understand. Yes, yeah. That's why actually this class is usually much. usually two hours. I, I, I reduced it to an hour and a half because I lose my voice after a, you know, a certain amount of time. I'm going to tell you that I, I lose attention. I can I can yes. probably do an hour and a half. but No, I'm going to stop it. Yeah, that, that, that's why I was deciding which person to choose, how much longer, you know, how many slides do I have of this person? They're not as many as Marsha. There's not as many okay. as Cunningham, but they're a little more than the, uh, um, uh, did I have somebody short in the middle there? Yeah, the Iranian woman, right, yeah. Right. Um, okay, good, because otherwise okay. she can't even take it in. Yeah, I understand, totally. So, so I'm just gonna go back to the beginning. Some reason I can't start at the beginning here. So Vietnamese, born in Vietnam though, but grew up, in, not grew up most of her life, in the United States. An Mi Le. An Mi Le. That's how you pronounce her name. She was born in Saigon, Vietnam, 1960. Uh, she fled with her family as a teenager in 1975 in the final year of the war. Uh, you know, that's when the Vietnam War ended. Eventually settled in the United States as a political refugee. Uh, she received a BA, BAS, I guess that's science, MS degrees in biology from Stanford University, and then an MFA from Yale University. Her photographs, this is 
what does she photograph? That's the question. That's it's, it's a little hard to get your brain around. Examine the impact, quant consequences, and representation of war. I'm just going to go through my I read. Um, it, color in black and white is oh. a tension between the natural landscape going on and violent transformations into battlefields. Some of them are real, and some of them are not so real. Um, her projects include things like Vietnam, which you know, that's the name of the project. When she went back to visit it the first time back in 1994, you know, a good almost 20 years later to see the countryside. Um, other things she's, she's photographed is um, uh, things, people, and I didn't know this, people, uh, re, I knew about war react, uh, war reenactors, you know, people who do uh, revolutionary war. I saw some of them in, in Brooklyn with Karen. We saw people, you know, would show up and they'd fire a musket in Prospect Park kind of thing. Uh, the Battle of Brooklyn, but um, people reenact all wars, including the Confederate War of uh, the Civil and uh, Vietnam War. Uh, so part of what she photographed was that, you know. But then she also got herself. She said, "Okay, but there's people who are practicing it a little more real than just playing it. U.S. Marines, Navy, who are constantly preparing for war. So she got herself, quote unquote, embedded with some Marines in South Carolina." With the United States Navy around the world on, on ship for months at a time, um, photographing what what goes on in the, uh, on those things. So I'm going to read a little bit about um, what uh, 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 a critic, Holland Carter, this is the Times, New York Times. Uh, so it comes out November 23rd last year. Sorry, a little too fast there. Uh, the initial photographs of the Hamas Israel war arrived as if as if out of nowhere, like a kick to the chest. You know, suddenly you turn on the there it is. How could this mutual slaughter be happening so suddenly and on such a scale? I thought of the American poet, Walt Whitman, he says, stuttering his shocked reaction to America's civil war. This is Walt Whitman. The dead, the dead, the dead he keen, our dead, south or north, ours all, 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 all. Kind of poetry, but not, but basically, you know, he was not a warmonger, uh, Walt Whitman. He was, but go on here. Another another American poet, political activist, Muriel Ruckheiser, much later, 1913, 1980. Um, she wouldn't have been surprised by it because she lived through a different era. Um, but uh, the history of the idea of wars beneath our other histories, right? We don't really think about it, but it's how we teach it, you know, such and such war. And then General so-and-so did that. It's, it's in some ways, you know, the battle of such and such, you know. Uh, she cool, she cool, coolly wrote in the late 40s. This was, remember, beginning of the Cold War. And we just finished World War II. But here's, here's the point. War, with its guarantee of violence, she was saying, is always in progress somewhere, maybe everywhere, in one of three predictable stages. Preparation, detonation, and cleanup. And we saw that from Iran, the Iranian photographer, the Boko Haram women you know, who survive, and you know, just it's 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 continuing. So basically, that's the subject of on me lay, and it's a little arty, you might say. It's kind of like what she does. That's a picture of her. She's using again one of these big cameras, not always, but a big camera on a tripod like this. I'm guessing this was somewhere she might have been on on a, a navy ship where they might have required you to to wear, you know. Um, Head protection because you're always ducking into, uh, you know, portholes and, and 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 you know they want her to be safe. Things not get hit in the head. You know, a sailor is supposed to know where the dangers are, but uh, she might not. Um, so I'm just going to go back to the beginning again and go through them. So let me know if you have questions. Uh, so 1960, she would be about 70. Uh, sorry, 60 something, 62 or something. Um, this is recent, right? 2011. So it's not like Vietnam, but it's still Vietnam because this ship was visiting Vietnam. It's one of the first ships to, to get back there. You'll see it again later in the, in the pictures. Um, they have 29 Palms is a town in California, but it's also next to a Marine base there where they run practice of like how to invade, how to break into houses, how to stay alive, but also get the bad guys that you're looking for. So this is obviously maybe soldiers graffitis, you know, or maybe this is telling them good Saddam, bad has free Saddam. You know, it's like you're okay in this one, but you may be not okay in that one. But, you know, you've probably seen photographs like this or maybe even short clips 
of what you have to do when you're in dangerous, uh, quote unquote, enemy territory. So they trained to do this kind of thing. He has a sniper in North Carolina. Um, actually, here, I think this might have been a, uh, 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 Vietnam uh, recreation, you know, this, you know, and because this guy, I think, actually has the black pajamas of the Viet Cong. Yes, yeah, I think this might be the recreation. And here is just, you know, what we're going to see here in a couple of weeks, right? <laughs> Watching the clips, you know, 1995. You know, she's people living in everyday life. You know, her memory of it was, uh, you know, under terror, under bombs, always worrying. Her family left in '68, went to Paris, came back in '73. Into, into Vietnam. Two years later, they had to get out again. They were lifted up literally by helicopters out of, you know, the uh, the last uh, days of, quote unquote, the fall of Saigon, which is now what? Ho Chi Minh City, I believe. Yeah. This is actually a young girl she photographed uh, visiting. She calls this her self-portrait because um, she doesn't have photographs from that point in her life when she was that age. Family, you know, when you leave as a refugee, you lose a lot of stuff, you know, your money, your you know, the heirlooms from your grandparents, the family photos and stuff. So this young woman who worked in a, in a field. Um, this is kind of interesting because I actually saw this movie, but I saw it because I teach this other course on alternative war movies. So this was a movie called... I saw this of... movie. You saw this movie. Okay, so I don't have to tell you about it. It's basically based on a true story of, of people disillusioned Civil War soldiers, Confederate soldiers, who go to war against the... The Confederate Army, blacks, poor whites, deserted soldiers. And, you know, it ends badly, as you can imagine, because when you're up against an army, no matter what army, they're going to win. They have bit more war weapons and such. But it's interesting. But this happens to be, she was photographing for whatever reason. I guess maybe she was invited or tried to get herself invited during the filming of it. So here's this modern day 20th century people with microphones and cameras and lighting equipment. And they have like this diffusion thing. So the light isn't too harsh. And there's the, the troops down in the trenches with their, uh, with their rifles. Just everyday, you know, modern uh, 1984, anyhow, uh, Vietnam. And here's our young people, you know, 2010. You know, this is, they're preparing. What was this phrase? Three predictable stages, preparation, detonation, which means you're in the middle of it, and cleanup. Uh, this might happen again. Here we are, in two, earth, oh, this was earthquake relief in 2010 in Haiti. My understanding from what I hear on the news is, the United States may be sending troops into Haiti because of the current situation there of many gangs and, and there's no there's no law, no sense of law going on in the country. People are suffering. Um, these guys are um, reenactors. And, 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 and what she said about them was they accepted her because they took her to be uh, uh, necessary to their, their script, as it were. She's an enemy combat photographer because she, of course, looks, she is Vietnamese, she looks Vietnamese. Why is this Vietnamese woman walking around taking photographs in our encampment? Oh, right, because she's, you know, it part, it's part of the reality of, you know, of what was going on, you know, back then. Here's the one where they showed up in 2011, the first U.S. vessel to show up in, uh, back in Da Nang, of all places, yeah. Um, these are uh, flare, flare uh, uh, shells, so it was tracer bullets, I guess they call them too, yeah. yeah. Training session, you know, it's kind of, my understanding is it feels like war when you're, you know, they put you in a safe place maybe, but still uh, it, it could feel like it. And then there is the modern, this is, so this is the cleanup from a war, right? Yeah. Decommissioned Civil War statues taking down recently. There's a, a Robert E. Lee on the, on the, on the right. Uh, you know, they're, they're not destroyed, but they're put somewhere well, until such time people say, well, we'll put them in a museum and we'll put the appropriate history so that people understand them in context rather than have them in, town squares and wherever you are in, you know, North Carolina, South Carolina, uh, pick a town, uh, uh, Virginia, Alabama. Of course, nowadays, um, the Navy has uh, women, of course, you know, combat. Her job is line shack supervisor. I'm not exactly sure what the line shack is on a aircraft carrier, but I bet it's like, you know, you get in there, you get on the radio, you air traffic controller, maybe. Maybe that's what it's called air traffic control on the top of an aircraft carrier. This is not her photograph. I, I we put this in there. This is photograph 1967. I think it's by a French photographer. Sorry, I didn't remember to catch his name. But she will use photographs like this from history, from history books, from newspapers and such uh, in her installations about the war. Because she, because some of what she's trying to do is make an immersive, um, you know, 
in museums and galleries. So you can sort of, along with sound and, and then maybe film too, of, of what it was like to be there, to live through it, or maybe as a soldier to, to fight through it, whether you're a Vietnamese soldier or American soldier, it's still fighting. It's still, your life is, uh, um, and this is a recent book of hers. And I went just before uh, we went on onto the class, this was, uh, I went to see, this book is in uh, Minerva, you know, or Minerva or the other one the level down, Main Cat. Main Cat gets you to the college ones too. And so they're available for, for you know, sometimes some of the college books are not available for borrowing. They're just, you know, you know, in in house only, you know, local use only. It says, but th th this one is, and several others of her are. So if you get to this before me, great, take it out because I want to know more about it. I feel like I don't know enough about her, but what I do know has really piqued my uh, interest in, in in who she is and and what she's trying to do. Uh, you know, and and she's kind of in a unique position because she lived through some of this stuff. You know, and I could talk about it. I was never in the army. Anybody else here ever in the U.S.? No. I don't know. Yeah. So we only know what we know. We lived through a certain period of time in the United States, war protesting, whatever. Uh, you know, we saw our friends or relations and other people go off and maybe not come back, the young men. So, um, but for her, it was a whole lot really, you might say. Uh, so any questions or comments or you want to look at a single picture particularly or? Oh, you know? I'm good. You're good? Yeah. Karen? Okay. Yeah, I hadn't realized that I know there's Civil War and Revolutionary War reenactors and, you know, and the Society for Creative Anachronism, et cetera. Renaissance, yeah. I had yeah. no idea they um, were now reenacting the Vietnam War. I'm sure there are people who are doing this kind of thing. They're reenacting re Iraq yes. and Afghanistan, you know, yeah, possibly. Wow. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, just you could see why she uses a big camera because she does get really great detail. And if someone's moving, even in sunlight, if someone moves too fast, the exposure time might be a half a second or something. If someone moves their head fast, uh, they'll blur, where people standing still don't, you know. Um, but uh, and, and there's lots more out there. I just I tried to get a selection of a variety of, of what she was doing. But I, 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 I'm going to have to digest this more, you know. <laughs> I don't quite understand it totally, but I think I feel like I know she by the way she lives and, and works in Brooklyn in, in New York still uh she teaches at Bard College up the hill up the up the um, Hudson River okay so uh, there'll be a recording I'll send you a link if you want, if you missed anything or you want to see it again for some reason and and then there'll also be like a little uh page of links and such and spellings and for people who need it like her name you know by the way when you go to put her in the library this is her first name so it's so when you put her in to look for her, you put in L E comma A Ed dash M Y if you want to look up a book as as, as the author. It took me a while to figure that out in Minerva. <laughs> All right. So thanks everybody. You know and uh, thank you. Yeah. Well, well, yeah. yeah. Okay. See you next week. Bye. Thanks Bye. again. Bye. Bye. -bye.